So in the last day and a half, I feel one of the phrases I've heard a lot of is young ones. So the young leaders, the young ones. And I'm looking at myself, and the two next speakers are coming, and I'm thinking, are we young or are we old? <laughs> and the thought that I had in mind was the famous Britney Spears song. I'm not a girl. I'm not yet a woman. I'm somewhere in between. So myself, I think the next speaker is we're somewhere in between. So we're not young, we're not old. Um, around 10 years ago, there's a very successful billionaire I met who said the number one thing he's seen, very similar to the last speaker, was successful people had role models. Now, it's important to have a role model, a mentor in essence, that's alive. So don't make it be Gandhi, because he's dead. Don't make it be someone you don't know. Like, you may want Jeff Bezos as a mentor, but unless you happen to be related to him, you're not going to be able to meet him. It's got to be someone who's alive, and so you want to find these role models, and these role models will make a difference in helping you grow. So alive, but at the same time, do they stand the test of time? Will they fall from grace? There's a very close friend of mine by the name of Jim Lear. Jim Lear is the number one behavioral psychologist in the world. He's the coach to some of the most elite athletes in sports, business, military, as well as medicine. And he has a wall with all these amazing people he's coached over time. So on his, on his wall, one of his, his role models, he put up was a picture of Tiger Woods. He had to take it down. <laughs> he also coached Lance Armstrong. He put that picture up. He had to take it down. People, companies, continue to fall out of grace. If I took a picture of you and put it on the wall, will I have to take it down? That's a tough question to think about. So over time, will you succeed? And why that's important is the world needs heroes everyday superheroes that they can look up to, they can relate to, and role model after. So, did I get this to work here? <laughs> so my presentation, when I first met Shiv, I met Shiv around a year ago. We're sitting at dinner next to each other, and as we got to know each other, the realization that came to both of us is that I think we share a common mother. We were like kindred spirits, although we look very different. We were convinced that somehow our DNAs must have meshed. And when I heard him talk about Tegelf, the first thought in my head is, you're trying to build an army of Gandhis. But the modern day army of Gandhis is what I call the Avengers. If you ever watch the movie, the shows. So the, pre the, the presentation I'm going to give is Avengers Assemble. Because alone we can do good, but together we will do great. So the objective of my talk is twofold want to inspire, but the challenge I see oftentimes between all the TED Talks and everything else, too much inspiration, not enough action. So how do you create this balance where not only do I hope to inspire, but if I actually succeed today, I hope I walk away. 30 days from now, you can look back and say, I picked up that ritual, something you actioned, so it doesn't become a mental sugar high that you forget 30 days from now. So both inspiration and adoption. So I pulled this off a brochure, I think it's from last year for TGELF. This is a very big and honorable goal. Four different areas that the world needs help in. And I do hope, and I hope that I can play a role in helping you get there in your lifetime to make a dent in this. And when you get to the end of your life, when you're 80 years old, looking back at what was the meaning of my life, I hope your tombstone looks like the one on the right, where Intrinsic markers of success, true wealth, comes from helping others. And I hope it does not look like a tombstone on the left, which is you spending your life accumulating stuff. There's a quote I read a while back which said, when you reach the end of your life, the only thing you can take away is what you've given away. So I'm a business guy. I've been running my business for 20 years. And as a business guy, we spend a lot of time thinking, how will it not work? How things fail? So as I sit here and I plan for this presentation, I thought about what would go wrong? What would go wrong that this army of Avengers will not accomplish their mission? And I thought about how you may get seduced by the dark side. And I know you're going to look at this and think fame, power, money, those are things that we're immune to. I will not get seduced. If you remember Star Wars, Anakin Skywalker, when he got seduced to the dark side, he believed he was doing good. 
And that's what happens when you get seduced. You believe you're actually on the path to good, and yet you get seduced. How many of us will say, I will keep working, I'll, I'll, I'll make money, and once I'm flush with cash, I will spend my entire life doing charitable work? Well, you know what happens over time? The definition of flush changes. Million, five million, ten million. Next thing you know, you're competing with every other colleague you have to make more money. You're so insular, you don't even know how to help somebody else. So just really quickly about myself and Next Jump, the company I built. So I started this company in 1994. So if you do the math, I just turned 40 a couple weeks ago. 1994, in college, I was always in financial aid, and it was not to make a lot of money. I had a high school sweetheart, and I could not pay for my phone bills to keep the relationship alive. And I started a company so we can keep dating. Not the person I married, so I'll save you a question there. <laughs> we stayed in stealth mode most of history, as in we did not talk to the press. In 2009, the press started to cover us. The New York Times said that we are the one company they've seen that could compete against Amazon. TechCrunch is a, a well-known tech blog, and they talked about how this is a must-know company. Tim O'Reilly coined the term Web 2.0, and he said, next jump goes from stealth to must-know about, and then Dr. Jim Lear, the guy I mentioned, he said that Next Jump will be referenced in history as a turning point in how business changed. We have a very big, audacious goal in the company. We want to fix the world. That's big, and we want to fix the world, and how we want to do it is by fundamentally changing how companies run. Now, the journey was not easy. I raised a very large sum of money, $45 million, from individuals. This is unheard of in any company. No private equity, no venture capital, $45 million from 100 individuals, angel investors who invested. Built this company back up from myself all the way to 150 people. And then in 2002, shortly after 9-11, the dot-com bust. It got down to me plus three people. Four people on the company. I had nine months of unpaid rent. I had um, six eviction notices. Every Friday, I got on the phone to beg creditors not to force us into bankruptcy. I woke up every morning with a bloody nose from the stress. 60 days in a row of bloody noses. Yet we fought through it, built the company back up to 200 plus people. Now in the process, I've been seduced. I've had a lot of attempts at trying to seduce me. I've been offered in excess of a billion dollars to sell this company more than once. And people ask me, why don't you sell it? Your parents don't have money. You never came from money. Why do you keep your company? And I tell them, what would I do with all that money? You know what I would do? I would go look to buy a company just like this, because I need a vehicle. I need Avengers. I cannot do it alone. So I keep my company, and that is something that, that we've done. The other thing that's interesting in the company is this. Not only have I been seduced and had to fight it, I've seen amazing young talent get seduced. We are the top recruiter of engineering talent in East Coast schools. So MIT, Cornell, um, Georgia Tech, as well as CMU. And it took us four to five years to get that type of traction. 5,000 engineers apply for jobs in our company today, of which we have 75% of the 200 engineers, and we hire less than 20. It's easier to get into Harvard than it is to get into Next Jump right now. But you look at the talent that we have, and when we interview them, and we've interviewed talent over years, and I personally interview them, you meet these 21-year-olds who come from the best schools, they were, they were poor backgrounds, very humble, and talk about their intentions to better the world, to fix the world, make it green, help others. Amazing souls that you bring in. And then you watch them over a couple years. The first time they see someone they know who made a million dollars just because they happened to join the company that got bought. The first time they see a friend on the panel speaking on stage and they think, I want to be that. Written about. We are all corruptible. And I see them get seduced. And you think it's one person or two? In the hundreds. I've seen hundreds of 21-year-olds who came out with such pure intentions get seduced to the dark side. So I'm here because I want to make sure that does not happen to you. So going back to your training. Training to be an Avenger. There are three parts that I see before you get to become an Avenger. And the first part, up to the first 20 years, which is most of you here, is simply defining who you are your DNA. And then comes the training. And I know you're thinking, you know, I may be graduating, I'm ready to go and fix the world, you know, four pillars with TGALF, we're going to do this. Yes, you will. But realize you're in training. A lot of data out there. It takes 10,000 hours, 
10,000 hours to be great at anything. You want to become an Avenger, it will take you 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. It doesn't matter if it's in medicine, if it's in you know, playing piano, no matter what the field is, no matter what the discipline, it takes 10,000 hours, which equates to 10 years of deliberate practice. Now that means and assumes that you're practicing deliberately. Most of us don't practice so diligently. It may take us 20 years, it may take 30. So I estimate somewhere between 10 to 20 years, by the time you turn 30 or 40, you will be ready to be an Avenger. So I'm going to take you through who you are and what's important there, and then the whole training process of becoming an Avenger. So who you are. So this is from 0 to 20 years old, which is what, the sweet spot of what you're in. There's a guy I met, and he's a fascinating guy by the name of Simon Sinek. He wrote a bestseller book called Start With Why. If you get a chance to watch his TED Talk, he's the number two globally watched TED Talk of all time. And he came up with this concept. This concept at the center of the circle is around why we do anything. It's inside us. And, and he really spent a lot of time, and this has resonated with a lot of people. This whole notion of if you understand your why, you can almost predict what you're going to do next. You can predict what happened in the past. So I've spent a lot of time with Simon meeting and watching over the last couple of years everything from teachers, successful business people, um, sports, whatever discipline. And I see him in a matter of 10 to 15 minutes figure out someone's why. He pulls it out of them and literally in minutes he has them crying like big grown men crying like babies. He's predicting what matters for them in the past, what, what's going to happen in the future, and they're like nodding and crying. And I'm thinking, how the hell does he do this? And he calls it his magic trick. He can do it in 10, 15 minutes to anyone here who he chooses to talk to. Now, I'm an engineer by trade, so I don't believe in magic. But I believe in finding patterns. So watch enough of these things, you start to see patterns. And so the pattern I found that Simon did was this. He found two data points, stories that are in the past, typically by the time you're 18 years old. And Simon would tell me that 18 was a critical cutoff point. Now, what happens when you're 18? Most of us become an adult, which means we're independent. But up to 18, we're dependent on someone. And so what I found Simon doing was this. He would identify the person in your life that sacrificed for you. And that, by the way, is your hero. That is the person that will drive you. Now, there are a lot of you here who will say, well, you know what, now, I'm driven by thinking about you know, successful people like a Jeff Bezos or maybe a Steve Jobs or somebody else out there. But the future version of yourself is not what drives you. It's not what drives us. Now, there's a lot of parents in the audience who will say, I do it for my kids. Well, you know what, I challenge you and I'll say bullshit to that one. Because if you did it for your kids, the world would not look like this. It would be a lot cleaner, it would be a lot less corrupt, all the issues. We're leaving a terrible world for our kids. You don't do it for your kids. We do it for somebody who sacrificed for us. It could be a high school coach, it could be an elementary teacher, it could be your mother, it could be your father. It's one individual for all of us in our lives. Somebody sacrificed their life, their career, their path in order to give us a better one. And a lot of times we look back in time and we say, yeah, but I don't, I don't want to be that. I don't look up to that person. They're uneducated. They're not very successful. They can't present well. And you know what I found as I spent more time with Simon looking at this is the world doesn't go backwards. And you know what you have to realize? That person who sacrificed for you never wanted you to be like them. They actually, actually wanted you to be better than them. They gave up a big part of their life to help you get a leg up to go do something great, and they want you to be better than them. This insight of just finding this person in the past, and if you can identify them, and you will make a little token, and that may be Shiv Kemka, it may be Gori, it may be your mother, father, whoever that is, and you build a little token that you hold in your pocket. Because when you feel seduced by the dark side, you hold this thing and you remember why you cannot fail. They sacrifice for you and you owe it to them. So this is important because drive, motivation, if you have it good enough, you will not give up. So going to training, so this is now going from 20 to 40 years old. We call it human capital engineering. We use the word engineering with human capital because engineering, you think about things like launch quickly, iterate like hell. 
And we experiment a ton in our company. In 1943, Maslow built this Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs pyramid, where it was food and shelter at the bottom, emotional needs, mental, intellectual, and then self-actualization. 1943. Today is not 1943. You need a different pyramid. We built this little pyramid, just drawn on a whiteboard, and said this is the updated human capital pyramid of what drives us. The bottom is security, then there's health, then there's growth, and there's purpose. So I'll take you through this. So when I think about where you will fail, in professional sports, athletes tend to have security. They have job securities. They have money. They have their health. And they're growing constantly, but they lack purpose, so they lose their way. In the corporate world, you have a job. You have security, but you, know, you lose your health. You don't grow, and you lack purpose. And you burn out. In nonprofits, it's the complete opposite. A lot of purpose, but you can barely pay for things yourself. Your health is going down the tube, and you are not growing. So I spend time thinking about TGALF. The young leaders at TGALF, what do you have, and what do you not have? You have purpose, and it's a noble and it's an ambitious great one. You have security actually provided by TGALF, but you're lacking two things in the middle, your health and your growth. And this is why you will fail. This is why you will not complete your mission. So I'm going to take you through these two things. So first, fail point number one, your health. Now, why will you not prioritize your health? You don't have time. You're trying to fix the world. You're trying to go and do all these other great things. Where do you have time to go to the gym? You don't have time. And I'm going to introduce you to the notion, it's not about trying to get strong biceps. It's not about trying to look good, but it's about energy. So Jim Lear is the expert in this. This guy wrote 16 bestseller books, and he's a coach to the world's best in almost every discipline. And he calls this notion of engagement, which is the acquired ability, meaning you can train yourself like a muscle to acquire this ability to invest your full and best energy right here, right now. A new category of training, energy management. And it starts with exercise, sleep, and nutrition. Think about this way. How are you when you're tired? You haven't eaten. You're completely depleted of energy. Will you make the right call? Will you take the shortcut? Will you go for fame? Will you go for money? Or will you do the right thing? And most of us cannot. And this is trainable. The fail point number two, fear prevents growth. There was a speaker last night I talked about how zero to three, you have curiosity, you have courage, and then from three to 10, it just goes downhill. Why? Because the more you succeed, you're going to find that you have a brand, you have an image. You don't want egg on your face. You will protect your brand. And failure is what hurts your brand, in your view. Except failure is your friend. There's a very close friend of mine I met who taught me something profound in this. His name is Josh Wakeskin. If you ever heard of Josh Wakeskin, he was the number one chess player in the world. He then went and did something very odd. He said, I'm going to change disciplines, and I'm going to become number one in a totally different field. Martial arts. Chess, martial arts. And the martial arts he went after was a field in Taiwan where a guy held the title for nine years straight. There's a tournament every two years. It took him six years. He actually became number one in martial arts. It's like crazy. He then wrote a book called The Art of Learning, where he transferred everything he learned from chess into martial arts and wrote about the learning process. And the number one lesson out of the book, so I'll save you a few bucks, don't even bother, is this notion of investment in loss. Losing is an investment, and you have to make it. So when he was trying to learn martial arts in the beginning, he would go to this dojo in New York, and the sensei would say, Josh, investment in loss. Now go fight this guy who's had eight years' experience to you. He's 50 pounds heavier, and keep fighting him until you beat him. Invest in loss. And Josh would go up, and this guy would literally fling him against the wall. The paint would chip on the wall because he's so freaking big and strong. And he would be flung against the wall 50 times a day. And the sensei would say, Josh, calm down. right? Don't panic. You can beat him. You know, like Just get your senses. And he's like, how the hell am I supposed to calm down? He's... Eight years more experience, 50 pounds heavier, I'm going to die, I can't calm down. <laughs> Josh kept investing in loss. One day, one week, he kept going for months. And then something profound happened one day while going to the dojo. This is months after being 
thrown against the wall 50 times a day. He had this realization, I'm not dead. I'm actually alive. I hurt a lot, but I'm not dying. And that was the day his fear started subsiding. And then he saw patterns. He saw that this guy does the exact same move all the time. And as soon as he saw the pattern, everything slowed down. And that day, he beat him for the first time. Now, when Josh first met this opponent, he thought to himself, why is this guy not a national champion at least? He's so damn good, so damn strong, at least the national champion. And what happened after Josh beat him that day? He refused to ever fight him again. It's when he realized this guy isn't a national champion because he does not invest in loss. You must invest in losing. So next jump is a living example. How we practice this in every initiative we do, and you'll hear this phrase of better me plus better you, which is at the top. Um, we created a little mantra where we said we do little things so that others can do the great things they're meant to do. Why is it little? It's only little if you're getting better and better. When your cup is overflowing, you have the ability to give. When your cup is empty or not adding more, you scrape and scrape at the bottom. At some point, you have nothing to give. And why do you grow? So that you can actually better others. And when you combine this phrase, and this is something that both Jim Lear and Simon Sinek helped us put together, and we thought it was so us at Next Jump, our culture. And then we realized, wait, this is fairly universal. This is a universal formula, not just for companies, but for human beings. If you invest in a cycle of first better me for the purpose of better you, and you keep cycling through, you will get better. You will become fulfilled. This is the formula that we live under. I have dozens and dozens of examples, 40 to 50 initiatives we have under each category. I'm just going to walk you through one, which is exercise. We build gyms in all our offices, put everyone onto teams, and with 200 employees, of which 150 are engineers, most of them never stepped in the gym once in their life. These are people that if you told them to go to the gym, I mean, they just looked at you like, I'm not going. This is the graph of what happened over the years. We first got 5 to 10% of the employees going to the gym. We did not give up. We kept pushing and pushing and pushing. The last three years, we've averaged 90% of the employees go to the gym regularly, working out a minimum of twice a week, if not more. It's pretty crazy stats, but this is what I love most. People started talking about how they don't get sick as much. They talked about how the quality of sleep is better. They talked about how a 9 to 5 job was tough, but now I can work 10 hours and I don't even feel tired. They talked about the fact that they found community at the gym. People couldn't believe, and this is my favorite. The fitness center, nutritionist class, and competition form a comprehensive, impressive program. We know the program is working. My son is twice the man he used to be. I have more letters from the mothers of our employees because you know who worries about our health when you get a call? Your mom says, are you sleeping? Are you eating? Are you okay? They care about our well-being, and that is awesome. That is a reward that every CEO wants a lot more of. So what happened when we got all this right? Well, we became the best at recruiting. Everyone started poaching our engineers. They would take someone who had 100,000 salary and offer to two to three times it in less than a year. Our turnover by 2010 was 40%. And by the way, the scary thing no one talks about in the tech world, that's kind of normal. They move around so much, no one talks about attrition or retention. Well, the last 18 months, our turnover has been holding at 1%. They're still getting calls and nobody leaves. You ask someone, do you like your job? People say yes. You ask someone, do you love your job? And people pause. Love is a word you say for very few things. And it's definitely not with job. 90% of our employees say they love their job. And then what showed up last actually was revenue. Our revenue has been growing 25% year over year for five years. The last year, it jumped to 60%, and it's still accelerating. This works. So I leave you with two takeaways. Health and growth. Go to the gym twice a week minimum. Now, I know fitness freaks in here will be like, that's not enough. You need to go four times. It's a low bar. You can do it. Start at a low bar. Go twice a week. If you don't go to the gym, don't sleep that day. If you don't go to the gym that week, literally don't brush your teeth. Make it a ritual. You have to do it. And why exercise above all else? When you exercise, rarely do you come out of the gym and start eating pizza and candy bars afterwards. You eat healthier. When you exercise, you will sleep better, but also there are studies that show that an average human being needs eight hours a day. But if you exercise regularly, you can function on two hours less per day as someone sleeping eight. 
That's pretty powerful. Go work out regularly. The growth, invest in losing. Make sure by the time next year comes around, you have a list of all the mistakes you've made because you experimented like hell. I'm gonna end with just a quick personal story of my father. And this is a source of my drive. My father is the most famous corn scientist in the world. We grew up 17 years living in Nigeria and West Africa. He's been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize three times for helping trying to end world famine. But he's never won the Nobel Prize. And the toughest thing for me growing up as the oldest of three kids was watching the struggles of my dad. And his number one gap in, that he has as a skill gap is the ability to present. He cannot present. Written, oral, he has a stutter, talks too fast. And the crazy part for me growing up was this. I was a carbon copy of my dad. I had a stutter, I talked too fast, and literally, I would rather die than get up on stage and speak to anybody. And somehow, while building my company, as I watched my dad you know, just ask for a little help editing his papers, editing his presentations, and people wanted 50% of the credit for his 30 years research, they wanted access to his IP to be written on the Nobel Peace Prize. His principles were too high, he always said no. They always try to take advantage of him. And I watched this, unable to help. And somehow, by the time I got to 24, raising the biggest chunk of money I raised, I woke up one morning and I was like, oh my God, I know how to present. And I had this spiritual feeling, this realization of that God put me on this planet to be the half, the other half of my dad's skill set. So I tried to leave the company twice. And two CEOs were tearing apart the company. Next thing you know, 9-11 hit. We went down to virtually nobody. I couldn't leave. I couldn't leave my baby. So I kept working. And before you know it, 10 years went by. 34. When I turned 34, I get this phone call from my mom. My father had a stroke. He, he's diagnosed with diabetes. He's still alive, but something changed in him dramatically. His energy level plummeted. And he used to always tell me, that getting the Nobel Peace Prize is like a megaphone. It would amplify the good work he's doing and get it across the globe so much faster. And that day, I felt like it would not be a megaphone. It would be a trophy sitting on our mantle. And in that same month, I met this billionaire who told me, I only buy art from living artists. I believe in putting fuel behind those who can do something with it. So starting that day, we changed the mission, the mantra of the company, the idea of doing little things. Do do little things so that others can do the great things they're meant to do. And that's what we believe in. So, thank you.